In the previous video in this series, I explained what neurons do, how they are interconnected by synapses, and that the weight of synapses can be used as a form of non-volatile memory. But how do synapse weights change? I'll show you that it's a lot more interesting than just neurons that fire together, wire together, and what you think you know about heavy and learning probably doesn't work. I'm Charles Simon, longtime AI researcher, software developer, and manager. Beyond AI, I've developed software for neurological test instruments and neural simulators. I created the Future AI Society to explore how neuroscience can inform smarter, more human-like AI. A lot of effort has gone into our open source brain simulator projects, and I'll be using them throughout this series for simulations and demonstrations. As a quick review, neurons can generate small voltage spikes which travel down the axon to the synapses. When receiving a spike, each synapse emits neurotransmitters which open gated ion channels and sends a number of ions to its target neuron and contributes to that neuron's firing once a threshold is reached. The more gated ion channels, the more ions will be sent to the target, and so the number of ion channels represents the weight of the synapse. Obviously, changing the number of gated ion channels changes the weight of the synapse, and this is what we call learning. How synapses learn is the topic of this video. Brains use several mechanisms to control learning across different timescales, from milliseconds to years. The most widely understood is Hebbian learning, which dates clear back to 1949. It has since been refined into spike timing dependent plasticity, or STDP. But that's such a mouthful that I'll often continue to call it Hebbian. STDP is a specific mechanism by which synapse weights change depending on the timing relationships of neural spikes on either side of the synapse. Hence the name spike timing dependent plasticity. If the postsynaptic or target neuron fires shortly after the presynaptic or source neuron, the weight increases. If the target neuron fires shortly before the source, the weight decreases. If only one of the two neurons fires, or if they fire at exactly the same time, the synapse weight remains unchanged. But there are some limitations. When we look at the experimental data, and this is the best image I could find, you see a large amount of scatter. In this graph, the relative spike timing is plotted horizontally against the relative change in the synapse weight. Note that the lion's share of the action happens within 10 milliseconds of the spikes being coincident. Consider this data point at about 80 milliseconds and 15%. If a synapse has a weight of 0.05 and we want to raise it to 0.15, it will take eight spikes. This would take a minimum of 640 milliseconds, over half a second, way too slow to be of consequence in the thinking process. In the simulations which follow, such long time frames tend to gum up the works and everything beyond 4 milliseconds is ignored. This data has been refined into this idealized exponential formula. The scatter means that this formula is only a loose approximation, and it is impossible that synapse weights can be controlled with any degree of precision. The synapse weight is related to the number of gated ion channel proteins on the postsynaptic side of the synapse. We can assume that there is a physical size limit to the synapse itself, so there is also a limit to the number of ion channels which can be stuffed in. Experimentally, the maximum synapse weight observed is about 0.15, with one being defined as sufficient for a single source spike to cause the target neuron to fire. 
To more clearly illustrate the action of a Hebbian synapse and its limitations, let's simulate two neurons, labeled A and B, connected by a Hebbian synapse which currently has a weight of 1. You can see that if I fire neuron A, neuron B fires shortly thereafter. Since the synapse weight is already 1, the weight remains unchanged. Since actual weights do not exceed 0.15, we'll say that my synapses of weight 1 represent 8 synapses in parallel. To lower that synapse weight, we must contrive to fire neuron B shortly before neuron A. We can do that with a few added neurons, and we'll label this one with a minus sign. We'll connect it with a synapse to neuron B. By the way, all the white synapses I'm adding have a fixed weight of 1. Now if I fire the minus neuron, it causes neuron B to fire, but nothing interesting happens. But if I also connect the minus neuron to another neuron to introduce a 1 millisecond delay and then connect that neuron to neuron A, now every time I fire the minus neuron, the weight of the Hebbian synapse is reduced because neuron A will fire shortly after neuron B. We can add another similar pair of synapses, which will fire A before B. When I fire the plus neuron, the synapse weight will increase, like this. For illustration, I've chosen the Hebbian formula parameter so that the single plus spike will exactly balance a single minus spike. But suppose we wanted more precision. Instead of a single neuron delay, about one millisecond, let's duplicate this circuit with two neurons of delay. Now we can reduce the weight by 25% instead of 50%. We can repeat this process by adding yet more neurons for more delay to create whatever precision we like. That's the STDP rule in a nutshell. Here's a quick review. If the source neuron A spikes shortly before the target neuron B, the synapse weight will increase. The amount of time between the two spikes determines the amount of the increase. The closer the spikes, the greater the increase. If the target neuron spikes first, the synapse weight will be reduced. But there are a few observations that this simple demonstration of Hebbian synapses brings to light. The remainder of this video will provide some details which will subsequently drive much of the logic about how your brain must work. Obviously, using eight or more additional neurons to control a single synapse weight is implausible. So some additional process must be going on, but if we just let neurons A and B fire in the normal course of processing information, the precise relative timings are unlikely to result in any useful learning. The more precision you want in setting a synapse weight, the more accurately you need to control the relative spike timing. In this simulation, the relative spike timing is selected to be in precise one millisecond intervals. In a brain where electrochemical noise levels are high, it's impossible to control spike timings with that degree of precision. Further, the more precision you want in synapse values, the slower the learning will be. If you need to strengthen a synapse from its minimum value to its maximum, you should expect it to take multiple spikes in the best of circumstances. This is fine, but creates a clear trade-off between the number of distinct weights a synapse can have and the time it takes to set that weight. So higher precision means slower learning. Beyond being difficult to set with precision, Synapse weights are essentially impossible for your brain to read back. 
Consider this. To learn the weight of an individual synapse, you fire the presynaptic neuron repeatedly until the postsynaptic neuron fires. So if it takes only two spikes to make the target neuron fire, the aggregate synapse weight must be between 0.6 and 1, depending on the leakage rate. But when that postsynaptic neuron fires, the synapse weight might change. Ouch! It's a bit like quantum particles, where it's impossible to measure any value without disrupting the value you're trying to measure. To complicate matters, if the synapse weight is small, the target activation will never be sufficient to overcome the leakage, so the target neuron will never ever fire. In this example, if the weight is below 0.15, no amount of maximum rate spiking will overcome the leakage. So neurons can only use low synapse weights in combination with other synapses. In the lab, we can place an electrode on a neuron and measure precisely how an incoming spike changes the membrane potential and deduce the precise synapse weight. But your brain has no such technique available. Summary? Neurons can learn generally whether a synapse has a large or a small weight, but never its specific value. We could speculate on a special neural circuit which could determine the weight more accurately, but it would be even more complex and implausible than the example used to set precise values, and it would work at the expense of the synapse being used to represent information. So although you can theoretically set a synapse weight with an arbitrary degree of precision, neurons cannot determine what that precise value is. In my simulations, I ran into difficulties as I attempted to make the system learn more quickly. If pre- and postsynaptic neurons are both firing, as you increase the firing rates, the distinction between which is firing first and which is firing second becomes less obvious. If the relative timing is a bit off, so the target is 2 milliseconds after each source spike, it is also 2 milliseconds before the next one. So the weight will never be set. Could the relative spike timing be that precise? not without specific neural circuitry for the purpose. In an obvious example where you'd like a neuron to learn to fire in response to a specific pattern of simultaneous input spikes, for this to happen you'd need each input to have a synapse weight of 1 divided by the number of active inputs. So if you have Four inputs say you'd like the target to fire immediately if all four are spiking, and you'd like a synapse weight to migrate to 0.25. I'll explore this scenario in greater detail in a future video. But if we extend this scenario to say that we want to recognize a specific pattern of four firing inputs out of a set of more inputs, and the others should not be firing, We'd like the other inputs to gravitate toward an inhibitory weight of minus 0.25. That way, if our four desired neurons fire, but one extraneous input also fires, our target will be suppressed from firing immediately. Hebbian learning does not address this scenario because it depends on setting a synapse weight based on a neuron's not firing we'll have to speculate on an alternative mechanism in the future. STDP addresses inhibitory synapses separately. As I mentioned in the previous video, inhibitory synapses have a different chemistry, so there is no way for a biological synapse to adjust gracefully from a positive to a negative weight, the way our simulated ones can. In the instance I'm describing where you don't know in advance whether a synapse needs to be positive or negative, we must have both an excitatory and an inhibitory synapse more or less in parallel. If a synapse weight is ever great enough that neuron A can cause neuron B to fire, even if it takes multiple spikes, the synapse weight will rapidly reach its maximum value as shown here. 
This also means that your brain can only set a synapse weight to approach its minimum or maximum values. So although a synapse weight is often considered a real number, it can really only take on a very limited number of distinct values. The minimum, the maximum, and a few values in between. At the high end, any firing will cause the synapse to migrate to its maximum, so all useful weights must be lower. At the low end, the weight will be too small for the synapse to have any influence on the firing of B. In between, there aren't very many discernible weights. In the last video, I mentioned that neurons are essentially digital. Perhaps synapses are essentially digital too. What do you think? Lastly, and most importantly, when I simulated clusters of neurons with only heavy and synapses, I was unable to get a stable network which was capable of doing anything. I hypothesized that most of the synapses in any network must be non-learning, with fixed weights. Perhaps the Hebbian rule only applies to certain synapses or at certain times. I have seen research which goes in this direction, but haven't gone into it in detail. In the optimal case, with both neurons firing bursts, one could expect to set a synapse weight from near zero to near one in perhaps 100 milliseconds. This is consistent with our observation that if I tell you that Fido is a dog, you can begin to recall that fact and make use of it in a fraction of a second. All this assumes that the synaptic connection between Fido and dog already exists with a near zero weight waiting to be strengthened. As I mentioned in the previous video, the brain can grow new connections, but on a completely different time scale. In this time lapse clip, you can see new axons and synapses growing over a period of hours. This process is ineffective if you need to learn something in a fraction of a second. Since your brain seems to be able to relate almost anything to almost anything else almost instantly, your brain clearly contains a lot of synapses of near zero weight just waiting to be pressed into service. While a neuron might have 10,000 synapses, brain research shows that only a few percent of these have weights which are not near zero. This is a key observation when we consider how much computational power we'll need to achieve human level AI. Unlike the brain, in a computer simulation, we can add new synapses almost as quickly as we can change the weight of existing ones, so there is no need for numerous non-zero synapses. Further, we can set the weight of a synapse to whatever value we like in a single operation. Coupled with the neuron versus transistor speed and power comparisons from the previous video, we should be able to build AIs which are at least match human level intelligence with much greater speed and lower power than we've achieved so far. In future videos in this series, I'll provide some insight as to how this could work. So let's summarize the key points I've presented about heavy and learning. For background, synapses interconnecting neurons have a size or a weight, which impacts the firing of the target neuron. This weight can be modified according to the Hebbian rule, but that idealized rule isn't as straightforward as it might seem at first glance. Weights cannot be set with precision, and synapse weights tend toward the extremes, either at their maximum value or at a value too small to have any influence. Conclusion, although heavy and learning explains many things, it cannot be the entire picture. In the next video, I'll address how synapse weights can be harnessed to represent knowledge. If this video has piqued your interest, take a moment to join the Future AI Society for free so you can participate in our online conversations. Also, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell to be notified when additional videos in this series become available. And as always, thanks for watching.